So hopefully you, you were able to get a sense, uh, a general sense uh, at least, of the capabilities um, of microgravity research environment and how that may be applicable to clinical practice, biomedical research, life sciences research, and, and other areas of interest that you have. Um, I also know that we have a rather diverse um, audience both here and online this morning where uh, non-biomedical research um, and more physical sciences questions could be asked as well. So um, in the time that we had this morning, we wanted to kind of give a very high level sort of 101 perspective, if you, if you will, of the unique physical properties of microgravity and how those can be um, tailored or, in, or in, and adapted into research initiatives, which will ultimately have impact back here on the ground. What we want to do for the second panel this morning is talk about, um, quite frankly, what are, what are the, the logistics and sort of the um, unordinary things that we as clinicians and researchers may not think about um, when we go in to conduct research in our laboratories on the ground, but are necessary to at least um, uh, uh, be aware of and contemplate in order for us to have success um, on this unique laboratory environment. So I'm going to present to you, uh, again, from a very high level, this concept of cases, what we are, who we are, and what we do. And then we have um, panelists here today who will also help step us through the sort of the, the very front end of how do I get my research on station, how do I get it going? Um, once I have that in place, what are the sort of the, the tactics, if you will, that are necessary to get through the wickets and hurdles and the necessities in order to do research in this um, closed loop environment? And what are some of the industrial partner support um, that is available from an engineering and hardware perspective that can actually, actually help us be successful? So with that, a, a quick presentation of the concept of the ISS National Laboratory. Um, this slide here shows that, in fact, the, the notion of the International Space Station has been around for quite some time. In fact, even during the Apollo uh, era when we were still pioneering uh, a landing on the moon, the concept of a space shuttle was conceived and it was primarily conceived in order to be the workhorse transportation mechanism, if you will, to get to an orbiting station. At that point in time, perhaps the concept of a research laboratory may not have been well rooted, but we knew that we wanted to get into low Earth orbit for uh, various reasons. Um, fast forward a couple of decades um, into uh, the, the late 90s and early 2000s, this was when we first had the concept of the International Space Station was going to be built um, and there would be a large capability um, uh, with respect to the real estate available to conduct research, uh, technology development and other initiatives that were going to be necessary for NASA to continue in its exploration mode. But at the same time, there was also a recognition that this concept of a microgravity environment could be of value to many other uh, interests other NGOs, I'm sorry, other government agencies, NGOs, and commercial entities. And so there was an announcement to, to look at managing the, the, the ISS, at least the research capability portion of it, um, from an NGO perspective. So in 2005, Congress made a push through congressional law to designate, at, at a minimum, the U.S. portion of the International St Space Station as a national laboratory. So the, the designation of a national laboratory means that um, it with, with that, it, it provides access to all others um, who can use it from a U.S. perspective. Um, further, in that decade, 2010, NASA, NASA Authorization Act then um, sort of created the, the capability for a non-NASA, non-government organization to actually be the manager um, of that laboratory. So hand in hand with the National Lab Opportunity and now an NGO managing it, the, the um, concept was it could be made available for everyone to use. And then uh, in 2011, CASIS was formed as that NGO entity, and we exist today working in partnership with NASA to create opportunities and, and to facilitate use of the ISS as a national laboratory. So one of the things I want to point out um, that may not always be clear when we, when we uh, partner with NASA to talk about the capabilities of the ISS is that we, we are not NASA. We work um, collaboratively and cooperatively with NASA in order um, for us to both utilize the same research laboratory, but really at the end of the day, we have two very distinct uh, missions, if you will, or, or intent, intended uses. 
Um, NASA's is one which is primarily rooted in utilizing ISS to better understand how we can have a prolonged and, and, um, uh, and manned presence, not only um, in low Earth orbit, but out and beyond. So for our Mars missions and other missions to continue to explore and to do that with a human presence, the ISS serves as a really great laboratory to understand how we can actually do that and be successful. CASES' mission is one in which we want to develop a diverse research and development portfolio, um, not only of, of science but also technology, where the outcomes, the knowledge, the, the IP, the products, if you will, that are derived from that research have a direct impact back here on the Earth. And so our target is to stimulate the research in the microgravity environment with a, a focused um, mission on making sure that at the end of the day there's an economic impact, if you will, um, with scientific merit that can be derived here on the ground. And we want to stimulate the use of that laboratory not only by government entities, but equally as important by other academic institutions and interests, and quite frankly, to some degree, the commercial marketplace. There is a, a tremendous push um, within Congress, within NASA, and elsewhere to eventually commercialize low Earth orbit. And there's a lot of value to that and a lot of benefit. One being is that it kind of frees NASA, if you will, from the government management of this capability because it's been pioneered, it's been demonstrated, and it's been proven that now it can be handed over to a commercial environment to then capitalize on. And it frees them up with the ability to take their limited resources and budget and continue on in their exploration mission. Our second major goal uh, as CASIS, is in, in addition to using the ISS as a national laboratory, is to actually demonstrate and communicate the value of microgravity research to the overall general public. Again, this has a multitude of, of, of value propositions in it, but the two that are primary are one is that by educating the general public that this actually has a value and that every, your everyday life can be benefited from the research that's done on that helps prolong the use of low Earth orbit into the future. And number two, as I think we discussed early this morning, there, there are scientific value principles that have yet to even be uh, explored. And sort of the, the, the cutting edge, if you will, or the next steps within certain areas of research could actually be recognized from doing it in this unique environment. And so that needs to be communicated not only to the, 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 the general public as of what the value is, but probably more importantly to the academicians and the researchers who have never really contemplated um, the ISS as a laboratory uh, initiative in their own uh, research objectives. Um, we are a 501c3 registered nonprofit, and we receive $15 million annually from NASA, um, but being a nonprofit, being an NGO, actually gives us the ability to generate other resources, both financial and otherwise, in order to accomplish our mission. Um, again, I, I can't stress enough that NASA is a huge cooperative partner with us. And if it wasn't for the engineering and technology expertise that they provide, and, and probably equally as important, the transportation logistics, as well as um, helping us with the on-orbit logistics, if you will, we really wouldn't be successful. So the diagram that you see uh, on the slide here kind of really represents cases in a, in a nutshell. Our research objectives are really diverse. Um, but at the same time, they're focused on terrestrial impact and, and benefit. And we achieve those objectives by conducting the outreach that I mentioned, by forming partnerships and collaboratives where research and technology development can occur. And we do this through issuing formal grants and solicitations that many of us are familiar with, but also by conducting more typical um, uh, B2B type of business development activities. We do this by issuing funds and uh, uh, incentives uh, to try microgravity as a research perspective, and we also generate funds with other partners who may have an interest in a, a, a specific disease line um, where the research is necessary to find a cure. And by doing that, we touch many um, beneficiaries of that, including the government, the public, academia, um, as well as industry and nonprofit associations. One of the things that CASIS needs to do in order to be successful is to sort of translate this unique environment into what is understandable to the, the common uh, researcher, if you will, who, who is used to going to the bench, conducting the research in a, in a standard laboratory environment and, and having results. And so uh, in addition to that, it's sort of um, 
uh, using the evidence that we have from the research that has taken place, albeit with a different focus at the end of the day, but translating that into what can be um, understood from a, a ground-based perspective. Um, we also uh, try to help the, the researcher, the investigator, if you will, understand that while there may be a certain way of doing the research on the ground, there are um, ways that we can do this in order to, to uh, stimulate success uh, in this unique environment. And so we partner um, with institutions and other companies to help either build hardware or engineering solutions or um, to help with understanding how you can still be successful in a research pathway that might be a little bit different from what we're used to. We work very closely with NASA to enable on-orbit operations and, and use of crew members, automation, uh, power, data, et cetera, everything that's necessary in order for us to be as close as we can to um, the gold standard laboratory on the ground. And we also coordinate contingency plans um, and help and assist with sort of getting the science and the data back in order to be successful at the end of the day. So our value proposition is really one that um, is quite unique. We have the ability to reduce the cost um, of, of, of doing research in space. What used to be a very uh, hefty um, proposition is relatively free. Um, we've helped to reduce the burden by engaging with industry partners who have done integration effort, hardware build, um, and, and understand how to take science objectives and put it into a piece of hardware to create a successful payload. And, and we work with them and provide them to the investigator who may be new to the scene, if you will. We also have the ability to create additional resources that are necessary, be those financial or otherwise, in order to stimulate the research activities. And we have access to the commercial sector to help propagate, if you will, the IP or the product that's developed on the back end. And so by working with our implementation partners and coordinating with NASA, collectively we support the investigation um, framework. And so with that, I want to turn it over to Cindy Buto, who is our Director of Business Development, to kind of talk about the proposition and where there's value in each of these uh, multitude of, of business sectors. Hi. Um, well, what I'm here to do right now is to uh, give you a little bit of an overview of how you can actually get your experiments on station. So you've heard all morning what the better overview of our organization and its role. And now, the, you know, the real question is how can you as a commercial company, a university, a researcher, get your flight experiments on station. And so stepping back away from that for a minute, if you look at the slide that's up there now, we are actually focused quite heavily on many different commercial areas. We started with the science itself, you know, the things that we talked about, what does microgravity and temperature extreme and radiation and vacuum conditions, what do those allow scientifically? But then what we've done, what we've really spent a lot of time over the last couple of years doing is translating that to commercial sectors and trying to make this relevant to why a non-traditional space user would think about using the International Space Station as a national lab. And I think it was interesting uh, this morning when we heard Robert say he had, you know, he had not thought about using uh, the space station for the type of work he was doing. And that's very typical when we're out talking to researchers. You know, you guys are focused on your your goals, your scientific goals, and you're not necessarily thinking about space, nor should you be thinking about space. And that's really the job that we're doing, helping you make that translation, understand the benefits, and then actually facilitate your project flying so that you, act, you don't have to worry about it. So we do a lot in life science. Um, we're working right now from a cases perspective with probably all of the major pharmaceutical companies. We're working with quite a few um, uh, just biotech, smaller biotech companies. We're moving into energy, oil and gas. Um, we've been looking at the aerospace and working with aerospace companies from a technology test bed. And we're moving into the other uh, areas that you see here. So uh, we're, we're pretty broad in terms of our applications, but I would say historically, the biggest uh, area that we focused on is the life science area. In terms of how do you get in, how do you get a project on station, we've referred to solicitations. And those are the, the uh, RFPs that we publish. And Gwen this morning talked about her project, which actually came in 
through an RFP or through a solicitation. These are formal grants that we, that we issue. To date, we've done, or this fiscal year, we've done three. We've done a remote sensing, we've announced a materials RFP, and we've done an enabling technology RFP. They're focused on specific areas, and you would respond to that like you would probably an NIH or other type of, of uh, solicitation. In addition to that, we're proactively working to get commercial and um, you know, academic opportunities on station. So that's the unsolicited route. And what we do is, it's a lot of education. We'll go out and we'll talk to you, understand your research goals, and then do that translation. Is there a flight experiment? Would it be relevant? Is the International Space Station a unique platform for you to be able to accomplish your research goals? So we're very aggressive in terms of getting new users that have never thought about using Station as a, as a, as a national lab. So for anybody in this room that's interested in flying a, a project, what you would do is see me and we would talk about what this experiment would look like. We would have uh, several conversations with our science folks. A lot of times we'll, we'll bring in NASA colleagues who have very deep expertise in the hardware and existing facilities. And we will work with our operations team to understand what this project will look like. We'll work together on a proposal, which you submit to us, and we have to, we, we go through this evaluation process where we have external, uh, an, an external science review process. We also have an economic review. Not only do we have to fly sound science, but we also want to make sure that there's economic return to the taxpayers uh, that have supported the International Space Station. So there is a review process. We work with you to develop a proposal that best will you know, be successful at, during this process. And once successful, um, we work with you through our contracts and a compliance process. Um, once that's over, we actually then uh, turn you over to our operations team who will act as that point person for you. Um, they'll be the conduit with NASA. They'll be the conduit with the implementation partners. And again, we don't expect you as a non-traditional space user to become a space, you know, a, a very deep in the space business. We want you to stay focused on your research goals and your business, and we will do that, that point of contact for you. This is just an example or a listing of the solicitations that we have issued. And um, in terms of payloads that we've done, if you look at the, uh, at the actual projects that have gone to station, there's a mixture. And earlier on, we saw quite a few coming from the academic community, and this was probably more in response to the solicitations. But I think you'll also see that there's a broad range in types of projects that we were flying. Going forward, I think you're going to see um, more movement to commercial type projects, which is our focus area, and you're going to continue to see quite a few projects in the life science area, which obviously, obviously is relevant for this, uh, for this crowd here. And I think, interestingly, especially since Joel um, was our keynote speaker this morning, we're seeing a very big overlap between you know, the physical sciences and the life sciences, and we're seeing more and more experiments that, that um, are drawing from each of those, those areas. So that's something that we're very excited about. And Joel, we're very happy that you're taking on your new position because we're looking forward to doing a lot more interfacing with you and your team as we, as we continue to do material type projects and, and especially as they relate to life science. So I think that is it for me. And if anyone does have any questions, you know, we'll be sitting on the panel. If we don't have time to talk about it today, let's make sure we trade business cards and we can certainly follow up after because we would really love to fly your projects. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. So that's our speed dating request for uh, this afternoon. Uh, I actually need to introduce Cindy properly. Um, uh, in addition to the work that she's done with CASIS as our director of business development prior to coming to CASIS, uh, Cindy served as president of the Collaborative Innovation Group, as well as a founding partner of the Russia Innovation Collaborative. Both of those entities were organizations that were focused on providing the tools and methodologies, <coughs> excuse me, to establish 
not only successful product offerings, but to help develop efficient opportunities to market. So those are really key strategies that we're now trying to deploy in our opportunity to, one, conduct research technology development <clears throat> on the International Space Station National Laboratory, but with a focus goal at the end of the day of getting those products into the marketplace, whether they be pharmaceuticals, medications, e et cetera. Uh, next, I want to ask Robbie Hampton um, to give uh, a, a little overview, if you will, on the logistics of uh, getting research to space. Uh, Mr. Hampton coordinates and manages the operational and logistic aspects of research project payloads um, on behalf of CASIS. He serves not only as liaison between the investigators, but also with implementation partners you'll hear from later, as well as NASA, to ensure that the science and technical requirements of the investigator, who is our customer, that their research payloads are addressed. Um, Robbie has served in numerous technical capacities on NASA projects um, in the past, including Commercial Crew Program, which is uh, developing as, as we speak, um, the International Space Station Vehicle Integration Project, Next Generation GPS Control, and the Advanced Sterling Radioisotope Generator Program. Robbie earned an aerospace engineering degree from Embry-Riddle University as well as a master's degree in systems engineering from the University of Houston. And we as CASIS were very fortunate to steal him from NASA uh, to work for us now. All right, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Billy. Um, so a little bit about my job as a uh, operations project manager for CASIS is to um, speak NASA ease with the folks at NASA. Uh, it's a difficult language to, uh, to learn. There's many acronyms that uh, most people don't understand right away. And so that's one of the, uh, the reasons I think they, they hired me is because I can speak to those folks. But a little bit about what we do in operations. Uh, we provide end-to-end -end support for your uh, research experiment or payload. Uh, through proposal development, we help you with the technical aspects of space flight, uh, what you need to cover in your proposal, um, <clears throat> the experiment design, helping you um, design uh, the hardware needed or find you hardware that exists, uh, help you with your turnover um, to the spacecraft and the folks uh, at the launch site, uh, on-orbit operations will help, me help you communicate with those folks on the space station, um, doing your experiment and make sure you get your data back, and as well as post-flight recovery, uh, helping you pick up your experiment. Uh, we serve as a liaison, as Dwayne mentioned, between uh, investigators, NASA, and the implementation partners. Uh, we offer you a free ride to space through NASA. That's kind of one of the, the big keys. Um, we uh, <coughs> help you uh, get access to that uh, wonderful laboratory in the sky. And we do have a uh, new payload operations uh, communication center coming to our facilities in Florida uh, where you can sit there um, and see how your experiment's doing, monitor telemetry, uh, communicate with the crew, uh, and those types of things. A little bit about the on-orbit capabilities of the lab. Um, we've touched on a lot of these before earlier, but I just kind of wanted to highlight uh, what it is you're able to do and how it relates to your lab here on the ground. Uh, there's various models to choose from in space biology. Uh, we've touched on a few of them today, um, protein crystal growth, uh, cell culturing, um, animals and uh, various types, rodents, C. elegans, zebrafish, uh, drosophilia, and even humans. Uh, we do have uh, numerous forms of temperature control on orbit, uh, freezers, refrigerators, incubators, uh, anything your heart may desire, in just about any temperature. Um, we do not have the capability to uh, flash freeze at the moment, but we're working on that. Uh, as far as power and data goes, uh, there are numerous kilowatts available for power. The ginormous solar arrays on the outside of the space station produce uh, an abundant amount of power. Uh, we have data capability. There's wireless internet on board, or you can hardwire and have your uh, data downlinked uh, to the ground. Uh, there's gr ground control support. Um, so you can uh, simulate the conditions of the space environment here on the, on the ground with temperature and atmospheric content. Uh, On-orbit observations. Uh, there's uh, the crew is there to monitor your experiment. Uh, we can take photos and videos and have those sent directly to you. Um, there's various light microscopes um, to image your cells. Um, there's also fluorescent microscopes. Uh, as far as crew interaction goes, what the crew can do for you, they can monitor your experiment, they can start it, uh, they can do fluid and media exchanges, um, drug delivery, uh, dissections, and fixation uh, to get your experiment ready to bring home. 
Getting there and back, um, there and back again, story of a hobbit. Uh, there are multiple launch opportunities per year. Um, roughly uh, five uh, commercial US companies, or they have at least five launches a year. At least that's the idea. A um, few SpaceX launches and a few orbital launches. They launch from here in the United States. Uh, we have roughly access to uh, 2,000 kilograms of up mass. So if you can imagine, that's quite a few uh, cell cultures. Uh, transportation takes three to six days from turnover to uh, the time the crew can activate your experiment or get their hands on it, um, depending on which launch vehicle you're on. Um, temperature and power are available during launch. So you can uh, freeze your samples, uh, fly them to space, uh, thaw them out, and start your experiment. Um, or you can have them incubated on the way to space, maintain temperature, temperature control. And those uh, same options are available on the way home as well. And we have uh, numerous pre-flight labs available at the, uh, the Cape and in Virginia uh, to support your experiment and getting it ready for, for flight. And uh, I've included a couple pictures of what the spacecraft look like that uh, you know, one day you could have an experiment flying in. On the left is the uh, orbital Cygnus uh, capsule, and on the right is the SpaceX Dragon vehicle. And that's uh, pretty much it for logistics. I think we're going to turn it over to Mr. Vellinger, who's one of our implementation partners, to tell you about uh, specific types of hardware available in the lab. Thanks, Robbie. So I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. John Vellinger. He is the co-founder of TechShot Incorporated, where he has served as the company's uh, executive vice president uh, and, and chief operating officer for more than 25 years. Uh, John's product development teams have designed and built equipment for many federal agencies, not only NASA, but the National Institutes of Health, NOAA, National Science Foundation, as well as uh, mul multiple DOD agencies. In addition to that, they've also supported the hardware and engineering um, support for Fortune 100 customers, including Procter & Gamble and the Coca-Cola Company. Um, John has developed equipment that has flown on several space shuttle missions, but they have a very diverse portfolio where they've also supported suborbital rocket launch experiments and uh, sorties of parabolic flight aircraft. He, he personally has seven patents issued to date, along with numerous technical publications. He's a graduate of Purdue University, where he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering with a specialty in Biomedical Design. Um, and if we have time, I always love the Kentucky Fried Chicken story, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that um, for people to kind of wonder what that's about. But John, thank you. Thank you very much, Dwayne. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, I think it's kind of fitting to kind of really close the loop. Uh, ten tech shot, um, is excited to be um, a part of CASIS and an implementation partner. And basically, um, if you're excited and have a desire to actually conduct an experiment, um, you need to work with somebody who um, has gone through the process and understands the acronyms, the requirements, so that you don't have to worry about all those specifics and all the, all the um, acronyms and all the um, operational and functional issues that you have to deal with as part of an experiment. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, TechShot um, is located right outside of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, we've been in business uh, for uh, 25 years. And um, we have a staff of approximately 40 scientists and engineers. And the, the exciting thing, the approach that we bring to hardware development is that you work with the, the engineering teams, multidisciplinary engineering teams, as well as the scientists. A lot of um, typical approaches in the past have been, OK, the, the engineers will build it and throw it over the fence and let the scientists figure out how to work it. Um, you really need to work with the scientists along the way and understand the experiment requirements and work hand in hand because there's a lot of trade-offs that you have to go through as you're developing spaceflight hardware that you cannot, um, you can compromise the science very quickly if you don't understand it. TechShot has uh, been in business 25 years. 
Um, as Dwayne said, we've had uh, seven different um, um, space shuttle experiments. You can see the uh, one on the left is uh, the kernel. Uh, that's the, the, the uh, experiment that Dwayne was talking about. But we've done, um, we've been really fortunate to work with a lot of great folks over the years in terms of Senator Glenn um, and just all the different astronauts and all the different research teams. We've uh, developed and have hardware capabilities to be able to do, perform uh, bone densitometry, uh, rodent research, uh, cell research, uh, including stem cells. We're currently working on a stem cell um, hardware piece of, piece of equipment, uh, protein crystal growth. Um, we've done avian research, um, C. elegans plants, Drosophila, as well as colloids. So now what I'm going to do is show you a little bit of some examples of that type of hardware that we've developed over the years that you could potentially work with. So this is the bone densitometer um, that we're currently working on, and this is actually going to go up on the space station um, in August. And basically, it, it provides the ability to be able to anesthetize a mouse and be able to conduct a bone scan on the mouse and measure the bone mineral uh, density. So that's a very exciting piece of equipment that we're going to have that capability soon on orbit to be able to do all types of exciting research. Um, here's another example. It's, we call it our sample transfer tool. Um, people say, well, you know, why is, it, why is it so expensive? Why is it so complicated? Just transferring a liquid in space has its challenges. And so you have to be able to provide containment. Um, you know, glass just doesn't drop to the floor, so the, the, the safety people are very concerned about, you know, would gla glass fragments get in somebody's eyes? Um, so there's all kinds of safety issues you have to deal with. So performing some simple operations that you would normally do in your lab on the ground take on an, an added challenge up in space. So this is a device we built to be able to transfer samples to be able to do on-orbit analysis and to be able to do sample manipulation. This is the payload that flew. This payload has flown twice. Um, you, you see on the right, you have a rotating bioreactor. Um, and this basically has a cassette design where you can put in different types of experiments in the cassette. And then the, the facility provides thermal control. So the whole goal is you leave the facility up on orbit, and then you take these cassette modules, and you insert them, process your, process your samples, and then you remove them and put the next device um, into the facility. This is the centrifuge we're working on. It um, has the ability to be able to have two ro rotating um, platters, rotors, and basically you can have one of your, um, plat rot uh, one of your rotors can be um, spinning and the other one can remain stationary so that you can have your control group right next to your experimental group. And then the unique and clever thing about this device is that the modules then can come in and out of the centrifuge. So basically you can take up your samples, you can conduct side-by-side -side experiments, and then either bring them back down and process or process them up on orbit. And then here is a microscope um, we're working on. Um, and this is basically to be able to take modules and insert them into this device and to be able to take uh, microscopic images of, you know, colloids experiments, life science experiments, um, really the sky's the limit. Here is an actual colloids module um, we're working with Glenn Research Center on and um, you basically you have, it's kind of like a fluids um, device where you have different bags and pumps and you can basically mix and you can look at the, the reactions and, and then put this device under the microscope and see how um, cells, colloids, all those kind of experiments, how they perform up in microgravity. So how to, how do you do microgravity research? I think the first thing is you want to develop your experiment objectives. And then you want to define what you want the hardware to do. So what we like to, to work with people on is, OK, how do you do it in your lab? Because we want to simulate that same kind of environment in space that you do in your lab. And then we have to talk about the operations. Operations sometimes become the limiting factor. So, you know, you, you, can't, or you can't just flip, turn on a switch and assume your experiment's going to, you know, kick off and go get started. 
And then I think the, the, the most important thing that you have to do is work hand in hand with the scientists and the engineer and iterate these steps because it's very important that you know you develop an outline what you think you want to accomplish and then all of a sudden you might have operational constraints, you might have safety constraints, you might have power constraints um, that, that have to force you to change your experimental protocol. And the goal, our goal is to provide maximize your scientific return. So we don't, do not want to compromise your scientific objectives and yet meet and satisfy all the NASA requirements from a safety perspective, from a verification, from an operations, and all the other people that have to check their boxes and make sure that everything's going to operate correctly. So, and that is the part that the implementation partner that you would work with, that's their responsibility. They worry about the safety, the verification, and all the testing that goes on. And, you know, the thing that we like to do, um, one of our kind of internal jokes at TechShot is, we like to wear the hardware out uh, before you fly it because you really need to spend time in the lab with the hardware going through, you know, experiment scenarios. And you learn so much by how do you load your sample, how do you unload your sample, and you really need to iterate that process and get that, all the kinks and all the bugs worked out of that. Then, you know, when it comes time to actually perform an experiment, you have to load your samples into the hardware. Um, a lot of times people like to conduct side-by-side um, -side controls, so you'd have a side-by-side earth-based control, and then you do your post-flight uh, sample recovery and analyze your samples. So that's kind of it in a nutshell, the process. It's a lot more complicated and a lot more complex um, along the way, but that just gives you a little bit of an overview of what you can do to actually see your experiment um, actually fly. Thanks, John. So this is going to be easy for me. I, I, I think I know the answers to the questions, but uh, <laughs> we're going to we're going to challenge our panelists this morning um, to kind of stimulate the conversation. Again, this uh, is is uh, open to anyone's uh, questions. Um, but I, I'm curious, Cindy. Uh, you mentioned that there's funding available uh, to do the research, and I'm hoping that maybe you can elaborate on how much, how do you get it, how sure. does that work? Yeah, I, I guess I should have started with money when we talk about these projects, right? That's the first question we ask. And I think both um, Robbie and John talked about the operational support and the ride up and the ride down. Just to start with, the value, the average value of a payload, the flight up, the on station, and the flight down, has been costed out to be about $7.4 million. <coughs> and that is a value that you're getting for free. So let's just you know put that to the side. The other thing is um, we have bits of seed money that we can support some of the development that John, I think, just really explained. You know, there, it's not going to be taking a piece of hardware that you use here on the ground and that just assuming you can use that on station. So there, there will be some cost associated with, with hardware or with implementation partners, and we understand that. So we, we do have some seed funding available, and that's part of the process that I described where you're, you're defining your experiment. And I, I'm actually going to steal your slides. I love that because, you know, when, when I've actually talked to probably four of you guys in the room in terms of new project ideas that you have, and we always start with the hypotheses. And then from there, we, we start to translate that into, well, what does that mean with existing hardware and what does that mean from a cost perspective? So that is all part of the process, and we can potentially support some of that with our seed money, or in the case of solicitations, we're actually issuing those grants. And then Dwayne mentioned, you know, we have these other partners and we, we put together a consortium. And ultimately, we also look to other external funding partners, whether that be other government agencies or private sources of funding. That's part of our, our marketplace where we identify what your total budget needs are and we can potentially find these other external sources. So, you know, it really is a very supportive model, just not just in terms of interfacing with NASA and with implementation partners to, to take the space out of your, your life, but also to understand what you need from an infrastructure and funding perspective and try to put those pieces together. So 
if, if I successfully encourage you to give me money for my research, um, I, I'm curious, how, how does it work? Do I drop off my sample to Robbie and things are good? What, what, Robbie, what's the next step in, in sort of uh, getting the space? Well, once you have the money in hand, you start uh, working with uh, folks like John here to help uh, get your experiment designed and ready to fly. We do that through um, hardware testing. Uh, we'll do a uh, payload verification test prior to flight to make sure you're ready to go. Um, there's some, some paperwork involved uh, that, that NASA requires to fill out to ensure your experiment's safe um, for the crew to handle, to be on board the space station. If you have any electronics, it doesn't interfere with the rest of the uh, electronics on board. And once you get through those hoops, um, show up at the launch site, you turn over your experiment, um, do some cargo management guys, and they'll put it on the spacecraft for you, load it up, and then it, it launches. And uh, once you're there, the, the crew will access it and um, start it up, hopefully within a few days. So John, in 25 years of, of supporting the hardware side of, of research, has there been anything that, that you've come across that you cannot do with respect to research because of constraints or safety requirements? No, there has been limitations. I think one of the things that I didn't explain, I mean, they're, they're worried about the materials, they're worried about acoustics, you know, because there's all this equipment up on the space station and they don't want, you know, astronauts to go deaf. Um, they're worried about, um, like Robbie said, the, the, um, the electromagnetic um, footprint from a commu communication standpoint. And so, what you do is you typically have to go through and work with the scientist and, and maybe you have to reduce the sample size or maybe you have to reduce or change when the experiment is activated or maybe you have to um, use a different process or procedure. You know, we had to lawfulize cells at one time for one, a particular investigator and then you <laughs> hydrate them on orbit. And so there's just a lot of different types of, of strategies and approaches that you take in, all in an effort not to compromise the scientific objectives, but to, to have those be complete in, in, in parallel and in, in coordination with all the NASA requirements. So I would say we, there's never been a situation where we couldn't fly something. We, we maybe had to alter or modify the experiment design slightly. So preserving the science objective, but, but doing what's necessary from an engineering perspective to meet the requirements. Absolutely. So you, you showed a few examples of, of um, hardware um, that your company has produced or manufactured or, or continues to use. Are those one-time uh, uses or do they come back? How, how does that work? Well, we like to basically say that they're available for anybody to use. And so, you know, basically um, you can you look, you can, there's multiple implementation partners and you can look at different types of hardware that's out there on the, you know, available for you as a scientist to utilize. And also NASA has hardware. And so basically you try to match your scientific objectives with the, the piece of hardware that has to be modified the least. And so um, we have hardware that, for example, if somebody wants to do bone densitometry, you know, we would be the logical choice for somebody to work with. So, Cindy, with respect to going back to the costs and the funding um, question that I asked earlier, if in fact CASIS funds to some degree a research project from one to 100 percent, um, do you then have to, do you take a stake in that? Do we have to give you IP or other rights? <laughs> it's, it's funny to look at Dwayne where he's asking a question where he, where he uh, very clearly knows that answer. <laughs> Um, I mean, we, we are a 501c3, we're a nonprofit. Our whole goal is to foster exploitation and utilization of the International Space Station. So we don't take IP. We want you to be successful. We want you to commercialize. Um, and that's part of the economic return on investment, right? Let's make sure that we're using this, this facility for, for big goals, better, betterment of mankind goals, but also for real return on investment economic goals. So no, we don't take a stake. Um, we, we make sure your IP is protected. All of those things as you would do your research and development and be concerned about, we make sure that we, we address those, those, those items up front. 
So John is a company, a for-profit company that supports um, the integration of science and hardware. What, what's your take? Well, um, basically, it's, it's a situation pretty typical to academic environments where if it's, it's a, a intellectual property that the investigator develops, it's, it's clearly their intellectual property. If we work on it jointly, then we typically have a sharing arrangement, and if we work on it solely, then we would claim that IP. But we've, we've had to cross that bridge several times with several of our investigators, and it, you know, it can be worked out. It just has to be talked about and dealt with and not just swept under the rug. Robbie, what would you consider to be the largest hurdle, I guess, or the, the biggest issue that you come across, uh, and typically in, say, life sciences research? In life sciences research, um, I think first and foremost, those new to, to the research are uh, intimidated. Um, but there are, uh, there are many options out there for cell culturing and life science uh, with the rodents especially. Um, we're looking at doing a lot of that research. But you know, one of the, the big hurdles is um, um, <clears throat> keeping gravity out of the equation. How do I get my experiment to the space station um, and activate it in the you know, microgravity environment um, and not let gravity affect it? Do I, do I freeze my cells and fly them up there? And if I do, if I do freeze my cells, how do I maintain their integrity? So that's one of the, the bigger challenges we have in the, in the life sciences arena. If I needed to involve an astronaut either to monitor an experiment or um, perhaps perform some function uh, within a certain step during the experiment, h how do I do that? Do I call them? I mean, what's the process well, for that? So generally, when, when you're designing your experiment, uh, along the way, we have um, folks at the Marshall Space Flight Center that work in the payload operations world. And they will help you write procedures that will then go up with your experiment, and the astronauts are, are there to follow the procedures. While the experiment is taking place, uh, you can listen in to the, uh, the payload communicator, the person here on the ground that talks to the astronauts. And if questions arise, you, you're there to answer those questions and help the astronaut along throughout their experiment. John, you have some? Yeah. The, one, another thing that you typically do is you put together a, a crew training video. And it's just a 15-minute video that provides an overview of the hardware function and how to operate it. And you don't really need to be responsible for that. The implementation partner typically understands the hardware the best and can optimize um, the, the story. But basically, you know, they, they try to keep things very simple and um, very short and to the point. Any questions from the audience that we can uh, entertain? Dave? I'm going to try to repeat that just so that we can hear it on the web. So the, the question is, um, is there a, a one-stop resource or a published list of uh, hardwares and facilities that are available? Yeah, so uh, there's, a, there's a huge list, our implementation partner directory. Uh, it goes through by the different um, disciplines, uh, live sciences, physical sciences, remote sensing, and uh, you know, kind of helps you identify what hardware is available, tells you who makes it, and how to contact them. And that's through the CASIS website. Um, so there is, there is that published, but I would also add that's a lot of the work that we'll do with you as we understand your experiment. We'll give you, you know, we'll give you a rundown of what are the available existing pieces of hardware, and it may include, it's a combination of, it's either NASA or implementation partners, so it's, it's the whole range, because sometimes it is pretty uh, overwhelming to have to go in and, and go through all of that equipment. So that is definitely one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing as we're talking about your project. Yes. So, so the question is, uh, do we offer internships? as part of the research uh, experience um, with respect to ISS National Lab, and if so, uh, is there any preference? I'll take that. <laughs> we, actually, we actually do have an internship program, um, and, and it's one in which we have um, 
I guess I should probably take a step back and say that Cases as an organization is less than three years old. So within two operational years, we have developed an internship program where we um, have fostered opportunities for those who may be working alongside of the investigators who we have either uh, funded or sponsored um, to enable them to continue some of the work that they're doing alongside their investigator um, in their own laboratory. In addition to that, we have also um, conducted internships which are closer to home with respect to cases, if you will, where they can work with our own organic scientists or engineers or other folks who are in the business office to help kind of understand the process of research in space. So we do offer that. Um, there's not really any limit or ceiling on, on what's preferable or, or what's capable, but this is probably a, a smaller element of, of, of what we do um, as cases. But, but let me also address, though, that in some of the research that we have sponsored, um, clearly there are uh, postdocs and, and graduates who are assisting, and um, we have indirectly funded that capability where in the proposal, the investigator clearly states that this is work that would be done to support the research. And so the, the funding that comes either through cases or through collaboration will go directly to, to support that. So that, that is certainly not a, a limiting factor, and that's one thing that we do encourage. Uh, what is the minimum and maximum time uh, allowed for a, a payload on orbit? Um, there's a couple different approaches. If you want to um, get your samples back quickly, you can actually go up like on SpaceX 4, one time the upcoming mission, they were talking about performing an experiment while the SpaceX module was actually docked with the space station and then bring it back. So that would be a, about a 20 to 30 day experiment or you can keep it up there for several months. So again, it gets back to what's your experiment objectives and how can you utilize microgravity the most to try to maximize your scientific return. So we've worked with people who have tried to do experiments that in less than a day, and they've also had experiments that have gone several weeks. And now with station, you can go months and years. There's also the capability to, to repeat experiments, to do follow-ons. So you're not limited to just that one flight or, or mission. You can build upon your results time after time after time and using that same laboratory. And I think that's one of the things that NASA should get credit for is back in the shuttle days, it was kind of a one and done. And now I think the mindset is let's fly often. And that's really what needs to be done. Thanks. So we're kind of at the end of our time for today. So if I can just summarize very briefly. Um, what we're really wanting to accomplish today was sort of a general message that um, there is now, for the first time really ever, an opportunity for anyone interested in research or technology development that um, doesn't necessarily align with, with uh, NASA's interests, they actually can, can um, conduct research in their own manner within their own interests. The ISS as a national laboratory is now open for business, if you will. Um, Cindy made a point that in the past, what was a requirement to cover all the costs associated with launching mass into space and the time, effort, and resources necessary to manage that and bring it home um, was a tangible cost. That is actually being absorbed now by the federal government. So in essence, those costs are free. Um, CASIS doesn't charge uh, for its services. Um, so at the end of the day, the, the, the costs associated with conducting research in space largely are those that are associated with the investigator's uh, own, own expenses. And then to the, to the degree that our implementation partners um, need to support the effort. Um, we have two major mechanisms in which we are attempting to utilize the National Laboratory. One is through the traditional grant process where on average we'll issue around four uh, targeted grant opportunities in a given fiscal year. Um, but 365, 24-7, uh, we do have the opportunity to um, work with you directly in, in the design and development of a research initiative um, that can come in any uh, flavor or design. Um, we have a cadre of approximately 25 to 30 companies, very similar to, to John's, that we work with. And so we help you identify the capabilities that they are best at and let, in, in, as necessary or, or as um, requested, we'll help you kind of find the right company to work with. 
in order to get through what typically can be sort of the, um, the painful part of doing research in space. But we like to think that we're approaching this with uh, sort of the white glove service delivery model where we take on the burden so that uh, you don't have to. Um, and with that, I want to thank the panel members for presenting very briefly today the opportunities that we have at CASIS. Um, you can visit our website. You can communicate with us directly. But uh, we're really interested in working with you in the future. So thank you very much for your attention today.